Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? I'm going to go ahead and start. If you can't hear me, I guess you, you won't be able to, uh, to write. I'll just send a message to everybody to make sure that uh, you can hear. OK, everybody's saying yes. Uh, I want to start out by thanking uh, for acknowledging the Algonquin people on whose land I am right now. Um, we don't have an elder to begin, so I thought I, I'd say a couple of words. Um, so I'd like to thank the creator for bringing the right people here today to share in this webinar. And I ask that my words be clear and deliver this message in a way that everybody will understand. And I ask that um, every participant receive the information they need to carry their work in the communities. So I want to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, I'm really excited to be giving this webinar because it's something I'm passionate about. And uh, it's a great way for me to connect with you. Um, I hope that, uh, that you get the information you need and that you enjoy this uh, format. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about my new company. For those of you I haven't been in touch with recently, I started uh, Native Way Training Services. And um, basically what we do is we specialize in creating, adapting, and delivering Aboriginal specific content. And uh, we pride ourselves to be guided by the seven grandfather teachings of honesty, respect, wisdom, love, humility, truth, and courage. Um, it's basically a continuance of what I've been doing in the past few years, but now it's more formal. So I hope that, uh, that we get to know each other better and I can share more of what we're doing later on as we communicate through this webinar. I'd like to actually invite um, Agnes Croxford from the Lynn uh, Leisure Information Network to say a couple of words of her uh, role in this, uh, this project. So Agnes, if you could take a couple of minutes and just give us a brief overview of your role and, and what you'll be doing today. Hi everyone, this is Agnes Croxford. I am with the Leisure Information Network. Um, we are a virtual nonprofit organization that provides information to people who work or volunteer in uh, parks and recreation and we do it all online. So um, uh, my part in this project it was the redesign and relaunch of the Northern Lynx website. Um, if you are staying on the line at the end of, the, of this uh, webinar, then you'll get a, a quick tour of the site. And um, so I hope to talk to all of you at the end of the session. Thank you, Agnes. And I want to mention that Agnes worked really hard to get this uh, website uh, revamped the way that uh, we wanted it to, to be. And uh, she did an excellent work, uh, job, so I'd like to thank you for that. Um, I'd also like to invite Colin to speak a little bit about uh, the role of Queen's University. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Colin Bailey, and I'm a student here at Queen's University. Uh, so I just wanted to speak a little bit about Queen's role in the evaluation of this webinar, uh, which is essentially a continuation of the Everybody Gets to Play Toolkit workshop evaluation. Uh, if you aren't familiar with the workshop, uh, for this webinar component, we simply really want to know uh, if the online format is a good way of providing information. Uh, if you did agree to participate in the research, we really appreciate that, and you'll get an email at the end of this uh, session uh, following each webinar, and with every evaluation that you're able to complete, uh, you have a chance to win a $25 gift card. And if you have any uh, general questions or concerns, uh, you can feel free to contact me at Queens here, uh, or Dr. Levesque or the Ethics Board, and in your letter of information, uh, there's a number and an email where you can find me. Excellent. Thank you so much, Colin. And I, I want to underline again how Queen's University has been instrumental in this whole uh, project and, and everybody gets to play uh, workshops. And we're going to be presenting together at the National Aboriginal Physical Activity Conference in Vancouver. And uh, hopefully you can be there if you're not participating in our meeting prior to that and uh, find out what we've uh, put together and, and the results of, uh, I mean, we're not finished, uh, or they're not finished compiling all the information, but if you can make it to that session, it would be great because you can find out what we, found, what we realized through the workshops that we gave throughout uh, Canada in 2011. 
Um, I'd like to speak about uh, Canadian Parks and Recreation Association. I've been working with them for a couple of years. Uh, CPRA exists to build healthy communities and enhance the quality of life and environments for all Canadians through collaboration with our members and partners. Uh, very quickly, as you know, I've been working with them for a couple of years now, and it's been quite the honor because I've been able to uh, c interact with all of you and, and hopefully help support you in the work that you're doing in communities. So I want to give thanks to CPRA for paying my rent for a couple of years. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so uh, at that, I think we'll, we'll begin. I want to apologize. I am working from home, and you might hear my dogs. I gave them a couple of bones, so hopefully they'll be quiet. But uh, I just wanted to warn you ahead of time. Um, I'd like to invite Jennifer Pelte, who's going to describe and, and uh, give us a little bit of an orientation on how this webinar can work. Thank you, Isabel. Hi, everyone. Um, like Isabel said, my name is Jennifer Pelte, and I'm hosting the webinar on behalf of the Leisure Information Network. Um, so quickly, uh, what I want to do is just go back to our welcome page so that everybody can just walk through this with us. You'll see at the bottom there are three boxes with some icons inside there. If you look at the first box to your left, you'll see the little telephone icon. Um, if you're joining us via the webinar and you're getting the visual feed, then you'll see just to the top of your screen um, that same little telephone icon. Um, if you're connected to the line, you'll see that it's green. Um, if at any point we unmute all the lines and we ask for your participation, this is where you can individually, if you choose not to participate, um, can mute and unmute your own line. Um, so again, that's something that we'll do um, once we're opening the discussions or questions and answers, and, um, and then you have the option to uh, participate or not participate. We do ask as a note that if you will not be participating over the phone at those times, that you just um, mute your line just for consideration because sometimes there are background noises that can be quite distracting um, during those times of the webinar. Um, secondly, in the center box, you'll see a little man icon, and again, that's to the top of your screen. Um, and uh, when you select on that, there's a drop-down menu that allows you to interact with the presenter in a unique way. So with this, if um, everybody could just go to their little man icon at the top of their screen um, and select it, you'll see the drop-down menu. Um, there's several options there. You can raise your hand if you have a question. Um, if Isabel asks questions during the um, webinar, then you can agree or disagree. Um, and then you can applaud, um, laughter, should something funny occur, mm -hmm. anything like that. So just to make sure everybody um, is seeing this, um, let's go ahead and select that little icon and let's everybody raise their hand just so that we see. There we go. Perfect. So everyone's raising their hand. And you can also see if you look into your attendees box, you can see exactly what's happening with everybody as well. Um, so that's with our little man icon. And then lastly, the last box just um, is a notification box. So should you not be connected to the call, and at this point um, I can see that everyone's connected, then um, you can always click on that little uh, information icon, and that will give you um, the call-in information that you should need um, to join us via telephone. So I'm going to pass you back to Isabel. Um, during this webinar, though, should anything pop up where you need any um, assistance with the technology at all, you can use our little chat box there, and you can enter any um, questions that you may have, and I will keep an eye out for that. Um, also, you can send me an email, um, and my email address is jpelletier at prontario.org, and I will put that in the chat box as well for anyone to see. And um, should the chat go on and on, and you need to scroll back to look, just look to your right, and there is a little scroll icon there for you to use. Thanks, everybody, and enjoy. Well, welcome back to, to my presentation. Um, today, we uh, first I want to tell you how we came upon this uh, topic. Um, 
before when we started uh, doing the planning on uh, this uh, this project to develop some webinars that would be relevant to community workers, I consulted with about 30 people. Some of them were individual interviews, and some were group uh, discussions. And this is one of the topics that was unanimously um, brought back up by every everyone that uh, that I asked that I spoke to. Uh, fund seeking, I mean, looking for money is, has always been a preoccupation when we're delivering these uh, programs. So I hope today that uh, you'll get some really important tips. And even if you walk away with one thing that, uh, that you didn't realize or, you know, a new idea or, or something that you can improve on, it's always a worthwhile time. Um, I also want to mention that at the end of the presentation, you will have time to chat. Um, and interact and ask questions. So I'm going to move ahead with this presentation because I don't want to uh, waste any more time. We have quite a bit of stuff to cover over this, uh, this webinar. So what we will be uh, covering today, tips on how to write fund applications. Uh, we'll learn how to develop systems to simplify the process. Uh, tips for great fund seeking. And uh, food for thought, building our own funds. Now that, that's something that I'm passionate about and if you've attended some of my um, presentations or workshops, you know that uh, I'm always looking to, to find ways that we can uh, fund our own programs. Um, and the resources afterwards will be on the website. I did send you a handout, or Jennifer sent it out to you. Uh, so there's some uh, information and grids that you can use on there. And uh, it, you know, I, I highly recommend that you stay for the website tour because you'll be able to see all the great stuff that uh, Agnes and her team put together on the website. So the format of the session, um, so we'll be delivering some information, and there are going to be a couple of polls, some questions uh, asked through polls. And those are from, um, yes, I just saw a, qu a comment that the, present the PowerPoint will be, I'm just going to interrupt very quickly, the PowerPoint will be available to people afterwards. Um, so I'm going to continue delivery of information with some questions asked through, through polls. So this is how Queen's University is going to gather some of the information throughout the webinar. Um, everybody is welcome to, uh, to contribute. Uh, open discussion and sharing with participants, that will be at the end. And there will be an evaluation after the information session, uh, after which uh, Agnes will take you on a brief tour of the new Northern Links website and all of its valuable resources. And that will be done on the webinar screen. So you'll get a private tour. So um, the reason we are giving these webinars is because of the Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines. As we know uh, from our work, only a small percentage of community members are meeting the Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines. So for health benefits, these are some of the guidelines. Children and youth aged 5 to 17 years should accumulate at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity daily. And to achieve the health benefits, adults aged 18 to 64 years should accumulate at least 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity per week in bouts of 10 minutes or more. Unfortunately, as you and I know, not a lot of people are meeting these goals. And it's our, our role and our mission to, to enable them or encourage, encourage them or inspire them to change their lifestyle and meet these goals for long-term uh, health. So it's also beneficial to add muscle and bone strengthening activities using major muscle groups at least two days per week. So that is strength training. We can do body weight training. Um, you know, it, it, you'd only need a space of maybe uh, six by six feet to be able to do some exercises at home. Uh, but a lot of people don't know what to do or how. This is where our programs come in. So adults 65 years and older with poor mobility should also safely perform physical activities to enhance balance and prevent falls. Uh, just like our youth, we need to invest in our elders as well. They're a fading resource right now, and unfortunately many of them are facing some health issues that are preventable. So we need to keep them in mind in our programs. So we all agree that more daily physical activity provides greater health benefits. Our role is then to create more opportunity for community members to achieve this. And for this, we need funding. And this is why we've created this webinar. So general guidelines. So our general guidelines when we're writing uh, grant funding applications. Oops, I lost my screen. OK, we have a poll. If you could just take a moment and answer the polls, and we can see the results on the right.
answer the second question as well. That would be greatly appreciated. Uh, thank you for answering the poll. That will be very helpful in gathering information. So when we start writing uh, funding applications, um, we need to be able to write it so that everyone can understand. They need to be able to understand that the project is appropriate for the funding source and that you understand the issues and have a creative approach. Um, you know, it, it also needs to be um, appropriate for your community. And we're going to talk later on about that, on how to assess what the needs are. You want to start small, one need at a time, when you, start, uh, when you want to identify goals. Um, it's very easy for us to get overwhelmed, because sometimes we want to change everything at once. You want to use simple words, uh, terminology that everyone can understand and, and know. Sometimes we have some lingo in our communities or in our work that others do, aren't familiar with. And I oftentimes, when I'm communicating with others, I'll throw off some words and they're like, or building capacity is one of them. Uh, a lot of people who aren't in our industry will ask me, what do you mean? You know, so we have to make sure that we explain things in a way that uh, everyone, whether they're in our industry or not, um, can understand. And it needs to be clear. Um, when we are sending in our, pres our funding application, we need to make sure that it's nice, neat, organized, and attractive. We have to consider the people who are evaluating this, and, and they're receiving quite a few documents at the same time. So we want to make sure that it, is, it looks professional because it's a reflection of our work. More guidelines. You need to know the, cr the grant criteria. You have to reread and see what, what is eligible and ineligible expenditures. So what's the purpose of the grant? Um, you also want to meet the deadline. These are things that uh, the people who evaluate our funding applications have um, mentioned that have been a problem. Uh, so sometimes we can write a great proposal, but if we don't meet the deadline, then they can't review it. So we have to make sure that we have a realistic budget as well, because that was another thing. If it doesn't make sense to them financially, then they can't approve it. Um, you know, we have to take the time to get the facts on what the expenses are. We can't just guesstimate what they are. Uh, if you can at attach some kind of, um, you know, report or estimate and, uh, you know, name the source, we don't, we don't need to write a lot on that, but just to, to prove that you've done your research and you, you can uh, show that this is an accurate uh, amount the, the, of expenses. So if you have any questions, don't be shy to call the grant consultants. If, you know, it, it's better to be safe than sorry, and they're more than happy to assist you. Um, you want to find out as well who received an award from them, like who was awarded a grant. And uh, you might ask them if you can get a copy of, the, of a successful grant proposal. Um, you also might want to ask for a score sheet to find out what their evaluation criteria is, because that can be very helpful. You know, some of them might give it to you. If, if they don't want to give you the actual score sheet, you, you can ask them what their criteria is. And you know, you might get something that's very valuable in information, and it might make the difference between you being awarded the, the, uh, the funds or not. So the six steps in the planning process, when you're about to uh, start grant writing um, project, you need to determine what the needs and assets are of your community and your program. Uh, you want to generate some program ideas. You also want to start making program decisions. Uh, when we have these ideas, we, there's so many things that can come up, but we have to decide which ones are going to impact your community the most. Then you have to develop a program plan. Implement the program design and then you want to evaluate the program. And that's always an interesting part. We're going to talk more about that a little bit further. So the first part in most of these uh, funding applications are identifying your community, your organization. Uh, basically, you want to, when you're doing this, um, you want to say who you are, what's your status, nonprofits, mandate, uh, your vision, your organizational structure, etc. Et you also want to include some successes and some strong points. I wouldn't make this very long, but you, you want to make this attractive. This is who you are, this is what we do, and this is what we've been successful in. 
Uh, you also want to enumerate some partners and collaborators. And uh, before you start, um, it's always good to have a team ready for um, your program. And what I mean by that is that you know who you're going to have working on this, who's going to help you, because this is something that you need to highlight in your proposal. So a tip for this, have your organization create a standard document with all the required information, updated on a regular basis and available to you at all times. So this is something that you don't necessarily need to do uh, when you're right when you're putting together a grant application. You can do that as we get off the phone. So it's always better to, to prepare because then you'll save time and you'll have it ready when you need it. So the preparation, absolutely key. Um, so the next thing you want to do is create a community profile. So collect statistics and data about your community, such as population. You want to know how many inhabitants you have, the demographics, so the age, groups, gender, etc. And you want to know what the health issues. So I've uh, included some resources in your handout. Um, and these are excellent because you, you can maintain a file system statistics in your community from the band office and update it regularly, or you can get information from uh, Aboriginal Affairs. I know they have another acronym, but uh, everybody knows who they are. Um, keep track of successful programs and be sure to highlight them through qualitative and quantitative information. So qualitative is um, to say, to describe how um, things were, uh, the positive aspects that you had on a human basis. So you can say that, uh, you know, there is more attendance at work or more attendance at school, uh, that would be qualitative. Quantitative would be the exact numbers. Um, so you want to include both values because people want to know uh, the benefits on the human part and on the numbers part. The other thing that you can do is you can use a community profile worksheet that you can easily modify if needed. So this, again, is something that you're going to prepare ahead of time. And uh, so what you can have is the ages, the population, the gender, and the special needs. And what we need by, mean by special needs is uh, they can be defined by many different ways, like spiritual, mental, physical, or the population, the elderly, youth, the young adults, kindergarten, pregnant, or high risk. Community assets. So the community assets are the resources that can be used to improve quality of life in a community. So that would include people, staff or volunteers, uh, physical structures, recreation center, gym, or playing field. Furthermore, it could be equipment, so soccer ball, score bar, uh, board, sorry about that, <laughs> anything that will be used to implement the program. A business that provides jobs or jersey sponsorship. Oftentimes, communities don't think of approaching uh, some of the, the local businesses that, uh, uh, that you know, benefit from our business. Uh, the grocery stores were there all the time. And uh, they're more than happy to support people who support them. Um, so I, I wouldn't be shy to go and, and approach them. So another resource is a community toolbox, and you have that on your handout. So I would uh, strongly encourage that you visit these uh, websites because you, you'll get some great resources, information, and ideas that you can use. Another, thing that, another worksheet that you can use is um, what you know, sport, recreation, cultural facilities do we have now? So if you can provide an outline, uh, and you can include this in, in this uh, funding application and say, well, this is what we have now, but you know, to run this program, we need, et cetera, et cetera. But if you have that already on hand, it makes your, your work so much easier, because you can just pull all this up whenever you've got a, an opportunity to apply for funding. So the next one would be, what sport, recreation, culture, equipment do we have now that we use for a program? So if you have uh, volleyball equipment, you want to write out what you ha what, how much you have of everything. So you have one net, five balls, uh, one pump for the balls, the first aid kit, et cetera. That's the volleyball equipment. That way it's easier for you to evaluate and identify the equipment that you need. And this needs to be reviewed regularly as well, because as we know, when we use them, um, you know, after a certain volleyball season, you might have three balls left. Um, the badminton equipment, same thing. You might have some rackets that are broken. So it's important to keep track of this inventory to be able to give an accurate uh, um, description um, to the, the funding sources. 
So defining existing programs. So what programs exist now in your community? What aspect of the individual is being nurtured, emotional, spiritual, mental, and physical? And also what time of day, season do these programs run? Again, as soon as you have the program or the plan for the season, it would be important for you to update this. You know, the more that you incorporate these habits into your, your planning session, then the easier it is when you need to pull them up because it will already be done. And uh, if you keep on top of it, then it's so much easier for you to, to provide this information when it's needed. So defining existing programs, what do you want to mention? Well, the age groups and the gender uh, that these programs cover. You want to include where the programs are located in, in the community, because maybe there is a resource that you're underusing. If everything is happening at the school gym, well, you might have a field uh, in a park that you're not using. And so you want to know that, because if you have an idea for a new program, then you can know where you can hold it. And you also want to know who is running these programs. Our people are our greatest assets. And it, it will, unfortunately, what we also see in the communities is, is it's mostly always the same people who are doing the work. But if we know who's running these programs, then we can maybe think of somebody else who can do it and identify potential um, participants or volunteers this way. So defining existing programs. You want to create a worksheet describing every program so it's so much easier when it's organized neatly. Uh, you want to note the existing programs sorry, the uh, aspect it's covering, the time of day, the age group, the facility, the people running the program. And here are some more resources for you to, to look over. Um, a great one was uh, Municipal Guide to Community Resource Inventory Development, Identifying Community Assets and Resources. Sometimes just going over these um, websites and the resources, we can uh, actually create something that's even more functional for our community and, and our grant writing style. Another great thing that uh, comes out of uh, doing this work ahead of time is we identify where the gaps in the programming. So we can see who's being served, what gender and age group, because you did that in, in the, the previous grid, um, who could be served better, and then are we making use of the community resources. So I mentioned that already. You can identify what is being overused and what is being underused. So once you've created the snapshot of your community, you want to evaluate it. And you want to come up with a vision, a strategy, a plan, and that will give you success. So we're going to talk about program planning. So program planning must be closely aligned to the mission and goals of the organization. Uh, you need to find out what type of program your target participants are interested in doing, because people might not want to do what is offered to them. Uh, there has to be an interest. So, you know, for your project to be a success, you need to do your homework first. Otherwise, it will be a lot of effort with little return. And the grant funders also want to look successful. So they want to know that they made the right decision. So if you do your homework ahead of time and find out what people really want, then you can integrate that into a program and give them what they need as well. Um, so to make sure that uh, your program planning is closely aligned, what you can do is you can actually get the information usually from the organization's website. Or if not, you can contact the, uh, the contact person and ask them what their criteria is and what you know, the mission and goal of the organization or of this funding opportunity is. The more information you get from them, the better. So how can you find out what people want in your community? Well, you can offer questionnaires, and you can distribute them at school. Um, you can create focus groups, uh, hold interviews, uh, observe, see what people are really excited about, and get community feedback. So you, we all, uh, well, most communities have a radio show or some way that um, people interact with each other. Some have a newsletter. So you can maybe provide something in that, or somewhere that everybody goes, a bingo hall. Maybe you can have a couple of people standing and talking to people and, and getting them to fill out a poll or an evaluation and find out what it is that they want. So more resources for this. Um, I've looked through all of these, and they're actually quite fabulous. So I would absolutely encourage you to, uh, to explore them. Uh, and as I mentioned before, they're on your handout so you don't need to uh, try to write them down right now. So our goal is really to create more well-being in our communities. 
So outcome-based programming. I want to talk to you a little bit about this because some of us do get intimidated when we have to fill this out. I remember when I filled out my first grant application and I saw the outcome-based programming, I was a little intimidated. So what it does, um, it looks at the impacts, the benefits, and the changes your participants will experience through this program. So when we decide to write the program description, we need to include the who, what, where, when, why, how. And think, when you're writing this, you need to think of any question that an outsider and, or an evaluator might have. Um, and you know, write it so that, they will, that you answer those questions before they ask them. So what you need to include is who you are and who are you targeting what activity you are planning, how, what is the method, the process, the technique you will use, and the effect that it will have. Where will the activity take place? When will the activity take place? And the next thing that you want to do is uh, write the inputs. So what the inputs are, they're all the resources you're going to need to implement the program. So that can include food, facility, transportation, equipment, supplies, volunteers, facilitator, coaches, program leaders, elders, mileage, promotion, accommodations. The evaluation. So outcome-based program evaluations look at the impact, benefit, and changes to the participants. So the outcome measure, um, say it's you can include increased knowledge, changes in attitude, increased skills, modified behaviors, or improved conditions, and improved quality of life. As I mentioned, this uh, webinar will be available afterwards, so you can review it at your leisure. So I, I know that I'm going through it quite quickly is because we have uh, quite a bit to, uh, to go over still. So when you're going over the outcomes, you want to make sure to describe how you've broken down the barriers described in your community profile. So say you're targeting lack of physical activity. Um, you know, in your report, you can write an, av an average of 20 kids came to play games two times a week, increasing their physical activity two hours a week. Now that's great, but they want to know a little bit more than that. So in your report, you would describe our strategy of holding our activity at the school at lunch hour uh, created um, more participation, an average of 20 kids. So you have to give a little bit more detail. Um, so some of the other things you'll include is that they had better attitudes, they developed leadership skills. And say you want to write uh, transportation. Transportation was a problem before. So on your outcome measurement, you can write, or your report, some parents volunteered rides. And that's good. I mean, this is a great outcome. However, you need to specify a little bit more and let them know, let the funders know how you got more parents to volunteer rides. So you might uh, add, uh, by making a call out to the community using the community radio show, announcement at the bingo hall, or through the school, we got more parents to volunteer rides. Okay, so it, these little details make a huge difference to the funders. So here's a sample of a logic model. So if we look at the inputs here, we have money, facilities, programs, staff, volunteers, participants, equipment, supplies. The activities could be how the inputs are combined to create the program, and people are doing the people who are doing the program or delivering it. Uh, the outputs can be hours of service delivered, number of participants, number of classes taught. Uh, the outcomes for short-term, inter uh, intermediate, and long-term, this is part of the, the evaluation. Uh, this is your goal and also what you, you get from the program. So you want to have increased knowledge. You want changes in attitude and values, increased skills, modified behavior, improved conditions, improved quality of life. Now these are all qualitative. You also want to include quantitative in that. So if you can add some um, statistics to this, people, the funders are very happy to have both. Um, so this is an example of maybe outcomes that aren't um, balanced, because we need to have the quantitative as well. So make sure to address each of the points in your program plan, and that the outcomes reflect the goal of the funding. 
Everything has to match the initial funding goal for it to be approved. One of the evaluators uh, pointed out that one of the things that annoy him the most is that people don't answer the question that's on the application. And uh, so for him, it's a waste of his time, and he feels like he's disrespected. So we need, re really need to read, reread, and then reread again um, all of the evaluation criteria and what they're looking, the questions that they may ask to make sure that we um, address them in a short, concise, specific, but pleasant way. So we're going to move on to budget planning. Again, this is a part that I found uh, many of the people uh, felt a little bit intimidated by. And again, if you do your homework before, this is, you know, there's no need to be intimidated. And if you don't feel comfortable with the numbers, don't be shy to recruit somebody to help you. So the budget is developed from the work you did on identifying the inputs and barriers to your project. So this is what determines your budget and your expenses. So more tips on budget planning. Look at what you already have and what is missing. So you've done the inventory of all the resources, the human resources, the equipment, um, the facilities. Now you, you want to have a look at that list that you made before you apply for the grant. Look at how you could get volunteers to borrow some of what you need. A lot of the funders are looking for a community contribution or organizational contribution. So you can go over all your lists and find out how you can contribute. You want to determine what expenses you have left. And uh, so you will outline what you're going to contribute. And then you have to outline what you're going to need. So when you're doing this, you want to look for areas where you can cut back and save some money and highlight that. You know, you have to demonstrate to the, the funders how you're being smart about your program and how you're helping them help you. You want to use the information to set a budget for unexpected expenses, approximately 5 to 10% of total revenue. Um, you know, you also want to write, like this is, uh, mandatory. You, you, it's very important to plan for these. Um, you know, maybe your equipment is going to fail, or you're going to break it, or something midway. So it's very important to always have that buffer zone. Um, you also want to highlight how you might uh, get some corporate uh, help or sponsorship. Um, and the funders are always looking. At, you know, is the budget appropriate? Is it logical? Is it realistic? And can you provide an explanation for the expenses? You know, they're not going to approve it if you, you need uh, something that's uh, what, what somebody would uh, consider frivolous. So there has to be a reason for every expense, and you need to be able to back it up. Review your budget on a monthly basis to determine how things are going. So this is while you're delivering your program. You want to do this as much as you can because when, you're, when it comes time for the report, and I think we've all been through this, you know, sometimes if we haven't done this, then we're rushing to, to uh, compile all the information. But if you've been doing it, you know, you take uh, five minutes once a week and you go through this and then you make notes, then it will be on hand and your report will be so much easier to write. So and as you do this, you may discover an area where you are overspending and then can adjust it accordingly. You know, and this is something that you can put in your report as well because they're going to see that you're uh, somebody that they can trust that is on top of their business, um, that is making sure that the money is spent wisely. And finally, always get a skilled accountant or somebody in a similar position to verify your budget to make sure that it is a clear that it is clear and it balances. It's so easy to make one small mistake and then everything will, um, will not balance. <laughs> so it's always great to have a backup. So finally, the evaluation. What does that determine? Well, it will determine what you did right. It will determine what you could improve. It will show unexpected outcomes, positive or negative. We need to be honest um, with the way things turn out because it's a learning experience for us and for the funders. And it's always important to um, determine as well what is needed to sustain your efforts. So it's great if you get funded for something, but then what happens when the money runs out? Um, you know, it, you, it's 
so important. What I've heard from most of the funders is that they want to know that um, the communities will take this funding and then do something else after. So to write like a next step, brainstorm with your team before, what can we do later? Who else can we involve? Uh, how can it benefit other community members? Um, if you highlight that, they will be very interested in what you're doing. So the other thing that you want to write in your evaluation, you want to determine whether you met your project outcomes. You want to use that information to improve future projects. And it needs to be part of your action plan timeline. So you want to choose two ways that are going to work best to evaluate your specific project. So example, you want to report on attendance of daily activities, um, observations, uh, positive or negative. Again, you want to see how people are reacting to your programs. You want uh, verbal participant feedback, uh, written questionnaires completed by volunteers, staff, and participants. It's very important to give a full picture. And that means uh, from every part, because we might think it's great from a community worker uh, you know, perspective, but then the participants you know, thought it was lacking in another way. So it's important to get that picture. The funders are looking for long-term success or results. So you know, it's important to list how you can build on this program and what your next steps will be and how it's going to be uh, beneficial. And you know, that includes maybe sharing the results with another community or another organization. And they'll be very interested in that. The one most important part of grant funding I have found personally, and speaking with a lot of experts and funders and people who write them regularly, uh, what has ensured the most success has been developing systems. And I've mentioned this throughout this whole presentation. Um, it's very important to uh, save steps, be prepared, and the more forms that you have ready and uh, the evaluations done, the easier it's going to be. So you want to schedule regular updates on community information, and you can even delegate the task to colleagues or even students. Making this part of the schoolwork can only help our youth learn how to help our communities. And I think, well, we all know this in Aboriginal communities, how important it is to uh, invest in the next seven generations. So if we can start sharing this with them, um, it would be, uh, we're helping the whole community, and we're maybe recruiting a future community worker. So one of the most important things as well is the cover page. That's the first impression that you give. Uh, what you'd like to do is maybe get a graphic designer to get a professional looking graphic um, of your logo and uh, the cover page that you can use over and over and very easy to use and, and just change the names and the dates on the, uh, on the top. And so if you have that ready, then it's so much easier to, uh, to apply. So a follow-up, you want to complete a follow-up report form mailed to you upon successful application. So say you did get a grant um, approval, uh, you want to be able to send them something as soon as they approve you. Uh, you know, whether they send you something or not, even a thank you note, uh, whether you are accepted or not, a thank you note goes a long way. People remember that. You need to provide copies of receipts of all expenditures, copies of canceled checks, or a schedule of the community's audited financial statement. That's in the report. Uh, that's usually due within 45 days upon completion of the project. Some of the recommendations, read and reread all of the grant criteria and be familiar with the guidelines before applying. Be clear about your purpose and the objectives of the project. Have community support from key individuals, groups, or organizations. You want to call the organization responsible for the grant to clarify any questions. Be clear about why you are seeking a grant based on needs and outcomes. Prepare an interesting, persuasive, and unique proposal. You want to have someone edit your application and then provide feedback, preferably somebody who's not in the industry because they'll be able to point out whatever points that uh, aren't very clear. You want to read again and always follow the exact guidelines of the funders. So you know, throughout your application writing, you want to be able to do that. So you, you read it and reread it and review. You want to attach letters of support. Again, this is something that you can do ahead of time so you have them on hand. And uh, you know, th there's, 
these are timeless. You can attach it whether it's uh, six months ago or two weeks ago. Um, a good word goes a long way. So again, you want to contact the grant administrator if you have any questions. Uh, and you want to follow up with the funder to inquire if they received your application. Another thing that I would add to that would be to uh, ask them, call them when, uh, when you get the note of the opportunity, call them on the format that they want it. Some of them will accept it electronically and others want to have a hard copy and some of them want both. So we need to be clear on that because that can uh, influence our successful funding application. So food for thought, building our own funds. This is something, as I mentioned before, I'm very passionate about because as we know, with the government funding is changing all the time and sometimes we're just building a momentum with some programs and then the funding changes. So if we start building our own funds, then we won't be as influenced by this. And what I mean by that is uh, we can recruit the students and, and build a community garden. So that would be one idea and then maybe we can sell the vegetables and the fruits that are cultivated and use that money for programming. Or um, you can talk to the bingo hall or the smoke shop or whatever business you have in your community or in your organization or near your organization and ask them to contribute, uh, you know, five to ten percent of their profits or their funds to programming. So that makes them look good and it's not a huge hit on their profits. Um, we've often seen that at grocery stores where they will ask us if we want to contribute a dollar um, to programming. So grocery stores in your area or other businesses are usually more than willing to help out in that sense. The other thing would be to have, um, you can organize a walkathon with your community members. So not only are you getting them active um, and meeting the Canadian uh, guidelines, but you can raise money with that so that they can either get sponsors or everybody pays like a $5 fee to participate in the walkathon or the dance-a-thon or the hula hoopathon <laughs> or the, the skip-a-thon. You know, it could be anything. Uh, make it fun, make it intriguing, and uh, everybody will feel good because they'll be participating to uh, contributing to the better health of their community. So the funders love to see people who are proactive and are thinking about sustainability. So the more we can contribute to what they're doing, the more they feel they're in a partnership with us, and it encourages them to, it encourages them to uh, fund us more. So here's some homework for all of you. Um, I'd like for you to plan some time every week to dedicate to gathering useful grant application information. Uh, plan some time every three months to review your community profile or add or subtract from it regularly. Mark your calendar for time to search for possible grant application opportunities. And another thing that you can do is actually subscribe to the Northern Links website because they do a lot of the work for you. Um, and uh, as you're going to see in just a few minutes with Agnes, there's, we've compiled so many interesting resources for you and we're going to continue uh, building it. Um, Agnes has been working diligently for that and her team is very committed to keeping on top of any information that might be useful for you. Uh, evaluate the return on investment. If it takes you two days of work to get a $200 grant, you may want to save that time for a $2,000 grant. Um, so pay attention to the opportunities and gauge your time with the benefits that you're going to get from them. So planning and preparing ahead will reduce your writing time and broaden your successful application opportunities. So with that, I'd like to finish and let you um, engage in a group discussion. If you have any questions or comments or anything that you'd like to uh, highlight or, you know, this is the time to do it. So I'll let uh, Jennifer explain how this group discussion can, uh, can commence. Hi, everyone. So we will be unmuting the lines um, right when I'm, I'm finished speaking. So as mentioned before, if um, you would like to participate, then you can go ahead and, and chat with Isabel. Um, if for, for whatever reason you would choose not to participate, then we just ask that you um, mute your phone by um, selecting the phone icon at the top and clicking on mute my phone. Okay, so here we go. Thanks, everyone. So does anybody have any questions, comments, anything they'd like to contribute or add to the presentation? Um.
just one thing. Um, you mentioned about a, a community toolbox. Is that the, the binder that we got at the the workshop that we attended in 2011? Um, or is it something different? Uh, it's something different. You have them in uh, the resources. So you can actually click on some of the links that I sent you on the, on the handouts. And you'll find the con there's a community toolbox resource, and what they have there are a list of resources that you can use to help you with the community profile, with yeah. program building, etc. So you just have to look through the links that I sent you on the handout, and uh, you'll be able to find some really cool stuff. So that's the handout. Like I've only got the one email regarding to the, this particular uh, seminar, and just I didn't receive anything else. Is there more emails that were sent out? Uh, Jennifer no. sent it in the invitation email for this uh, with, with the information. Jennifer, can you address that? Okay, maybe I just didn't. Okay. Hi. Yeah, so in the initial um, email that was sent out, there was just that one handout. Anything further that was mentioned throughout the PowerPoint, we'll follow up with um, after okay. the presentation, um, along with the actual PowerPoint itself. Okay. All right. Okay. I just want to get clarification. Thank you. Is there anything else? Question, comment, compliment? <laughs> oh, this is Christine. Uh, I work for uh, Motivate Canada, so it's uh, it's a little bit different. Cause, uh, we don't work right right in the communities. We're kind of providing support to communities. Mm -hmm. uh, is this? I thought this was a great uh, tool and resource. Is this something? You know, for example, the the attachment that was sent out in the email, um, is that something that we can share with communities if we're working to support them with their program? I believe all the resources, the webinar will be on the website, but maybe Agnes okay. would like to address that. Pardon? Oh, okay. Agnes? Hi, everybody. Yeah, all of the resources that are listed in the handout will be on the Northern Links website as okay. well as the PowerPoint will be there by tomorrow. And probably by next week, we'll actually have a recording of this session so you can hear Isabel's comments to go along with the PowerPoint. And um, I, I typed a, a little message in the chat area, but for those of you who are not able to stay on the line for the tour of the website, be sure that you go there soon and sign up to the listserv because we'll be constantly sending out um, news about funding opportunities and um, and new resources that are added to the website. Excellent. Thank you, Agnes. Is there anything else? I'm going to take that as a no. So the one last thing that I'd like to encourage everyone to do, and it's something that I do everywhere that I go, um, is network. When you go to a conference, a course, find out what others are doing. Uh, you know, it's, it's time that we work together. We're going to be highlighting a lot of this on the Northern Links, and the best part about this, and Agnes is going to uh, cover that in a little bit, um, that we are all going to be contributors. contributors. We can benefit from it, and we can also contribute. So if you've got a great idea or something that worked, or a great funding application that was granted, we can all share it on this website. Um, and I say this in every workshop. We need to work together. We need to support each other. It's time to stop competing and start completing and supporting. So I hope that you enjoyed the webinar. I am going to sign off. I had a great time um, putting this together, and I'm really honored that I was able to deliver it for you. And I'd also like to uh, invite you not only to fill out the evaluation, but um, to join us again on uh, Tuesday, February 26th, I believe, at 1 p.m. for our next webinar. And that one is Bridging Silos and Aboriginal Communities, which is another topic that has been identified um, as a problem and, and a, a subject of interest. So on that note, I'd like to say miigwech, and thank you for taking the time to listen to me for an hour, rattle on. I hope that you've gotten some value out of it and hopefully a couple of ideas. Uh, don't hesitate to send me an email, some feedback, uh, positive uh, you know, comments or uh, things that I can improve. This was the, my first webinar, so you know, I stumbled a couple of times. So I thank you for your patience again. So miigwech, and I wish you all to continue your great work and to have great success. Miigwech.
Okay, everyone. So um, those of you who are not able to stay on the line, um, uh, we'll give you a minute to, to leave. And um, for the rest of you, you should uh, very shortly be able to see the Northern Links website. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So um, first of all, I just want to say uh, thank you to the Public Health Agency of Canada for funding the redesign and redevelopment of this website. And also um, a huge thanks to Bert Crowfoot, who made his uh, fabulous photographs available to us to use on the site. And I, I think they really add to the site. Um, this is a grassroots site. As uh, Isabel mentioned, uh, it's as important for you to uh, submit your news items And, and your own uh, resources to us to add to the website as it is for you to use the site. And so um, I'll mention more about that as we go through this um, demo. But you should, see, um, you should see something on almost every page where you can ask a question or submit something to us. So on the home page, you'll see that we have a feature section here. And right now, we're just promoting the webinars. But as the webinars wind down, we'll be featuring new resources and uh, events there. And you can easily see some of the new items on the site just by scrolling down the home page. The very latest event that's been added, the latest um, programming success story, uh, news item, and resources are always listed here. Now, since today's topic was uh, funding sources, I'm going to take you to that section of the website first. We do list um, new funding opportunities here as we come across them. This is by no means um, a, a comprehensive listing. Uh, it's just things that we've seen in the news and uh, put here. We try to keep them up to date and um, take them off once the deadlines have passed. So for sure, if you know of uh, a source or an opportunity, um, let us know, and we'll add it on here. Um, I should have said, you're all unmuted. So if you have questions as we go along, feel free, or free to ask them. We have a news and events section. And we actually do have someone who goes through hundreds of online sources every day looking for items that might be of interest. We're focusing on information that's useful to people who are working or volunteering in recreation um, and health promotion. So you won't find um, a lot about really local events. You'll find more um, uh, things that are a professional development nature. Uh, same goes for the events. Um, we would probably only include a local event if we thought it was a really good example of something different that someone's trying. So that's news and events. We have a resource database. And um, here what we're wanting to present to you is really practical resources, things like checklists like questionnaires, like uh, forms you might use. You can download everything uh, in full text, free of charge. Um, it may be a link to something on another website. Um, but generally, we only uh, list things that, where you can get the full text of it, and it's, and it's free. Um, under the valuable resources area, uh, we put in specific links to the physical activity and sedentary guidelines and to a recreational toolkit that we think is very useful. Um, so we just wanted to draw those to your attention. But um, you'll see that there are two ways to search the database. Um, you could 
just enter a keyword like toolkit, for example. And you'll get a list of um, various kits that are available for you to download. And if you follow it, the, the link will take you right to where you can, can download it. Um, these are all given to us um, freely for people to use and um, edit them if you want, make them your own. You can also search by topic. And um, so if you look down, uh, anything that has a little book-like uh, icon beside it can be opened to find more specific topic. So for example, if we choose traditional games, um, you would get a listing of resources that have either are all traditional games or have some listed in them. This is an area that we'd really like to develop more. So if you have uh, a game that you regularly use, or any other resource for that matter, um, you can use this little box here to share it with us. And um, you don't have to give us a lot of information. Tell us what you have. Uh, and how we can contact you. And if it's not something you can easily upload, then just let us know you've got it, and we'll get back to you and talk to you about um, how we can get it from you. So there are several hundred resources in that database now, and um, you just really need to take the time to explore it. Similarly, we have a database of um, programming ideas. Um, which you can search by keyword or by organization, or you can even choose the type of um, setting that you're working in and get a listing. So I'm just going to see what we have in the way of walking um, programs right now. And you can see that what you get out of that is a pretty detailed description about what the program does. And you get contact information. So if you want to talk to someone um, and get more details from them or more help, there's usually some way of um, contacting people. If there is a link, we'll provide that as well. Um, we have uh, a page on Everybody Gets to Play because that's all part of this um, project that we're doing. And here you can actually download the Community Mobilization Toolkit and the uh, First Nations Supplement to Everybody Gets to Play. And I believe this is the only place where you can get these for free. If you um, went to CPRA to ask for them, you would probably have to pay. So I encourage you to take advantage of this um, little offer here that uh, CPRA made very generously to us. Um, and finally, we have uh, a listserv uh, called the Sharing Circle um, that I strongly recommend that you subscribe to. You're not going to get a bunch of junk mail. We're careful about um, how much we send out to you. You probably won't get more than one or two messages a week. Excuse me, a week. Um, but what you will get is um, every week or two weeks something about what's new on the website, if we've had a new funding opportunity come up or we've added some new resources. And as members, you can also um, ask questions of other people on the listserv or offer suggestions to them. So if you've got a really puzzling issue, you can ask some of your colleagues um, how they might handle it. Um, and um, on most, so there's a, there's a subscribe form right on this page. There's also one on the home page. And I just want to go back to the resources page for a minute to mention something I forgot, which is that if you don't find what you need on the site, um, feel free to send us a quick message. And we will double check that uh, whether it's there, maybe it's just something you've missed in your search or we'll um, go out and look somewhere else for it, or we'll post it to the, to the Sharing Circle listserv and see if we can get some examples for you. So it will be very helpful to us 
um, to understand what you're looking for so we know what to add to the site. And that's basically um, my tour. Are there any questions or comments? Well, I, I invite you to sign